Good morning and welcome to our Savior Lutheran Church. Uh, greetings from St. Louis. Paige, Noah, Micah, and I are attending a family wedding this weekend. Uh, for a variety of reasons, we are making use of our technology. So hopefully this works out well. Noah and I are, are working through a few kinks uh, in the videoing itself. So we trust the Lord will use it unto your good. We are in the midst of our series, Spiritual Olympics. Today's message is entitled, Teamwork. We pray. Lord Jesus, you are the Lord of the church. We are grateful that you have called us unto yourself, that you have enabled us by your spirit to take part in your mission and ministry. Help us to acknowledge more fully that we are in this together and pray that you would bless our labors with fruit for your kingdom. To you be the glory and the honor and the praise now and forever. Amen. By the way, there will be a test, so if you fall asleep, you may miss out next week. I want to begin by showing you two pictures from a previous Olympics. These are from the 2012 Summer Olympics. Four years ago, Michael Phelps became the most decorated Olympian in history. Gabby Douglas, on the other hand, became the first African-American woman to win a gold medal in the individual all-around gymnastic event. Both of them were celebrated for their achievements. And yet they didn't accomplish these things on their own. Yes, they represented our nation, but our nation also supported them. They were aided, if you will, by a small army of coaches and trainers and nutritions and chefs and sponsors and fans and friends and family members. Despite their natural giftings, neither Michael Phelps nor Gabby Douglas would have been able to compete in the Olympics, much less attain the goal without all those other people. It was truly a team effort. You know the expression, we are better together, well that certainly describes Olympians and their teams. Those who can no longer compete or those who could never compete at that level due to age or lack of physical prowess help others compete. Conversely, those who are athletically gifted are aided by others so that they can perform at the highest levels. Together they strive for greatness. Some, like Phelps and Douglas, actually attain the goal. It truly is a team effort. Today's Old Testament lesson highlights the necessity of teamwork. Admittedly, though, this curious story raises a number of questions for which there are no easy answers. Nevertheless, it provides us with some important information, especially as it foreshadows the work of Christ and the mission of his church. So let's set our text from Exodus chapter 17 within its context. When the Israelites are safely on the other side of the Red Sea, they sing a song unto the Lord. In it, you can read it for yourselves in Exodus chapter 15, in it they recount the Lord's power. He easily defeated Pharaoh and his vast army. They describe the Lord's nature. That he alone is majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, one who works wonders. And they also express their confidence in his ability to make good on his promises. In the 13th verse of Exodus chapter 15, we read, in your unfailing love, you will notice future, you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. 
these initial expressions of gratitude and confidence quickly fade. As the story unfolds a couple days after they witness the wonder-working power of the Lord at the Red Sea, they begin to complain. They lodge their first complaint against Moses, actually against the Lord, because the only water available is too bitter to drink. And the Lord responds by making it sweet. A few days later, they again grumble as their stomachs begin to rumble. They foolishly reminisce about how good life was in Egypt. They give the distinct impression that full bellies in slavery is preferable to being free and being hungry. And again, the Lord responds. He gives them manna in the morning and quail as meat at night. Sometime later, we read that they are encamped at Rephidim and they again grumble and complain. They grumble against Moses. They accuse him of engaging in nefarious plans and leading them out into the wilderness that they might die of thirst. Again, Moses cries out unto the Lord, and again the Lord responds. He provides, in this case, miraculously, he provides water from a rock. The verse that immediately precedes our text and the verse that closes out this section of the miraculous provision of water from a rock, it reads in this way, And Moses called the place Massa, and Meribah, which means testing and rebellion, because the Israelites quarreled and they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? That's the central question. Is the Lord among us or not? And how the Israelites answer that question determines their actions. When they answer that question in the negative, No, the Lord is not among us, then they do stupid things. They bow down and worship the golden calf. They refuse to enter into the promised land. Is the Lord among us or not? That's the central question. A question that the Lord continues to answer in the affirmative as we see in today's text as the Lord grants the Israelites victory over the Amalekites. As we heard earlier, Moses is clear in his directives to Joshua. As commander of Israel's army, he is to choose some of the men. Together they are to engage in battle against the Amalekites. Moses is also clear in terms of his own role as well as who is really fighting for Israel and against the Amalekites. He says, as we read earlier, tomorrow, and if you look at that word tomorrow, it is pregnant with meaning. If you trace it through the entire book of Exodus, you see that it indicates that something big is going to happen, that the Lord is going to do something in rather dramatic fashion. Moses says, tomorrow I will go up on the hilltop with the staff of the Lord in hand. I want you to think for a moment about how important the staff, Moses' staff here, appropriately called the staff of the Lord, was to Israel's deliverance. It was instrumental, for example, in some of the ten plagues that were placed upon Egypt. For instance, when Moses struck the water of the Nile River, the water became like blood and the fish died and was now undrinkable. When Moses raised uh, the staff, a plague of frogs invaded Egypt and most dramatically, when Moses raised the staff, the Red Sea parted and the Israelites passed through the Red Sea on dry ground, safely arriving on the other side. 
When the Lord first calls Moses, Exodus chapter 3, when he selects him to be the deliverer for Israel, deliver with a small d, he says, take the staff in your hand and use it to perform signs. And what are the signs? The plagues? Yes and no. The plagues were indeed signs, but signs of what? It comes back to that central question. They were signs that the Lord was indeed among them. That the Lord was far superior, much stronger than the so-called gods of the Egyptians were. Now picture Moses on top of the mountain overlooking the battlefield. This is the focal point of the story from Exodus chapter 17. Because what happens on the hilltop determines what transpires in the valley. That as long as Moses has his hands upraised, presumably with the staff, then the Israelites prevail in their battle against the Amalekites. But as soon as Moses lowers his hands, the Amalekites get the upper hand. So during this day-long battle, you can imagine it seesawing back and forth that Moses' hands are upraised, the Israelites prevail. As his hands become weak and weary and he puts them down, then the Amalekites prevail. And eventually we read in our text that Moses became tired and sat down on a rock. And Joshua and her literally lend a helping hand. They hold up Moses' hands until sunset, until the Israelites achieved victory over the Amalekites. And that victory, as we heard, was to be recorded for future generations. It was to be recorded so that there would be no mistaking as to how this victory was accomplished. It wasn't due to the bravery of Joshua. It wasn't due to the determination of the Israelites or their skill in battle. It wasn't even due to Moses, Aaron, and her. Victory belonged to the Lord. He simply allowed them to share in that victory. Jesus Christ is, as you know, far greater than Moses. Thus, it shouldn't surprise us that what he did on a hilltop just outside of Jerusalem accomplished far more. What he did on uh, Mount Calvary was not determine the outcome of a single battle, but he determined the outcome of human history. In his case, though, his hands were not upheld by caring friends, but were held in place by nails driven through his flesh. And what he accomplished was not the destruction of a nation like the Amalekites, but it was the saving of individuals from every nation, tribe, language, and people. In describing his work, Jesus said, I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Jesus was lifted up long ago. His battle with sin and death and the devil, a battle of which he was victorious, took place roughly 2,000 years ago, and yet Jesus is still drawing people to himself. And he's using individuals like you and me to do it. Jesus doesn't need our help, of course, any more than he needed Moses or Aaron or her or Joshua and many others to defeat the Amalekites. As I often say, Jesus doesn't need our help in accomplishing anything, and yet he invites us to share in his work. And what a work it is. We've seen clear evidence of that in recent days in the wake of the first of our six summer mission trips. As we shared in part last Sunday, the spirit of Jesus was stirring mightily in the hearts and minds of the kids who participated in our fourth annual mega sports and skills camp.
that when asked, a number of kids expressed their faith in Jesus. Some of them heard about Jesus perhaps for the first time, about his love for them, about the fact that he had died and rose for them. And some, because the Spirit was stirring in their hearts and lives, responded saying, yes, I believe. And that's just the first of several summer trips, both near and far, with two trips underway and three more that will take place later in the summer. Undoubtedly, there will be more and more stories of how people, having heard the gospel, are being drawn to Jesus. When we as a congregation talk about participating in Jesus' work, we use two descriptors, goers and senders. The goers are like Joshua and his fighting men. They are in the thick of things in Topsfield and in Jackson and in New Mexico, Bolivia, Portland, and Congo. The senders are like Moses and Aaron and her. They, we are called to lift up our hands in prayer, seeking the Lord's protection and provision for those who have gone, pleading with him to open the hearts of those to whom they minister, that many more might be drawn unto Jesus. Not one of them is more important than the other. Both are essential. Jesus uses both goers and senders to accomplish his mission in the world. Jesus uses both goers and senders in accomplishing his great commission. It is teamwork. Yes, it is teamwork at its best, we pray. Lord Jesus, we are grateful for the opportunity to be both goers and senders We recognize, as your word says, that you are ultimately the one who brings about the increase. That some of us sow and some of us water, but you alone are able to give life where there is death, to give faith where there is unbelief. We acknowledge that apart from you, we can do nothing but with you as we learn to live more fully, uh, abiding in you as we harness our energies and our giftings as a congregation, that we are better able to accomplish the things that you set before us. And we do pray, as you said long ago, that we would bear much fruit and that it would be unto the glory of your Father, to whom all honor and praise is due now and forever. We pray these things, Lord Jesus, in your strong and holy name. Amen. Hope you enjoyed the experiment. See you next week. God bless.